thanks for being here. It's it, it, it's a true honor. It's a pleasure. Thank you for choosing to come listen to some young guy talk about data analytics and uh, see what you can learn about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a story for the presentation. It's not related to the presentation, but that's how I want to open up. So I'm going to go back to my first year at my university. So I went to UBC and I want to tell a story about a friend that I had. Uh, this would have been back in 2015. Um, so I studied uh, computer and civil engineering, a mix of those two. And within my study group specifically, it was just four of us. But I want to tell you a story about one friend who's been studying with me. And this one guy, we'd always study, four of us together. He would always be out and always doing extracurricular activities, sports, clubs. I think he was in like 10 or 12 clubs in his first year. But he was not attending lectures. He was not studying, he was just doing clubs. I'm like, okay, cool. So maybe he'd show up once a week for a study session. So first year passes, all of us have our GPAs fine, we get into our first picks for our uh, engineering disciplines. It's a, it's a competitive choice for which discipline you get into into second year. And uh, we were like in our 80s and 90s, and he was in his 60s. So he wasn't doing too well academically. He got into his second choice. So second year comes around, and again, very similar. We're all studying, uh, working very hard on our courses, doing homework, doing extra assignments, and he's just doing all the same stuff, like extracurriculars and leadership stuff, clubs, volunteering, all that. The end of second year comes. We're applying for our first internships. He's the only guy in our whole study group that got an internship. And I was like, what? I'm working my butt off. I'm working so goddamn hard on all my assignments, all my lectures, and my GPA is really, really good, like 3.8 plus. And he's got barely a 3.0, and he got an internship, so what the hell's going on? It was his volunteering. It was his extracurriculars, it was his clubs. It was him going out and talking with people and working with people and not just going and sitting in a textbook, reading and studying that got him that internship. That's what I found. So third year comes around. Our study group and me, we increased our extracurriculars. Um, his GPA stayed around the same, but we had to increase our extracurriculars, but all of us had internships coming out of third year. So that was more standard. We were all happy about that. Fourth year comes along. That was COVID. So fourth year comes around. This guy, he decides. You know, so so COVID happened. We're all stuck at home. You know, he's he's studying elsewhere. We're all remote. He can't do as much extracurriculars or volunteering anymore because everything is virtual. Everything's effectively shut down. So what does he do? He finds studying as his new extracurricular. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he does. His extracurriculars and his leadership is reading the extra material, doing the extra assignments, doing the bonus assignments, the ones not for marks as well. That's all he does. And then surprisingly, his GPA goes up. <laughs> so that's kind of how his um, end of fourth year ended. And then after that, we all found our jobs and we all, we all started working in our full time. That was just a few years ago. So this is kind of the story of how it started. And just in case you haven't figured it out yet, that friend was me. <laughs> and that's how I started my journey, specifically into data analytics and, and the modern world, and what I'd like to share with you all today, uh, and how that experience through university actually impacted and changed how I prioritize what's important for me, how I can succeed, and balancing my extracurriculars and my academics. And it is possible to do well if you just put your mind to it. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself very briefly. And then there's two main parts of the presentation. The first one is my technical journey. So the experiences that I had throughout university and then post-university as well, and how all of those related to data analytics and branding with each one. And then the second part of the presentation, uh, which is an introduction to data analytics and also how to become one if this is a career path that will interest you. So that first half of the second part, I will set some baselines and tell you a little bit about the field and the industry. I worked in oil and gas, so that will be my primary focus. And then the second part of the second half will be how to actually become a data analyst. So if this is a, if the first half interested you in, in what I've been sharing, then the second half will explain what are some optimal career paths that you could consider, whether it be data science, data visualization, or data engineering. And then I'll also talk about what you, what actual steps you can do besides attending the presentation. So a little bit more about me. Uh, I like tennis. And Hearthstone is pointed out by the gentleman over there. <laughs> that's a side trip. That's a good one. Um, and yeah, I studied as, as the gentleman back said at UBC. Uh, started in 2015. I took six years. I did two years of co-op and a four-month exchange to Singapore, which was a great experience. But it took me six years overall. A lot of people in my time were saying five is the new four. Well, six is the new five. Maybe seven will be the new six. <laughs> so you get a master's and a PhD done potentially in that time. 
Anyways, uh, that was my experience. Um, I did a unique program called Integrated Engineering, and this was actually my second choice because I didn't get into my first one, which was Computer Engineering. Integrated is where I get to take two different engineering specializations and do a half and half degree. And there's also a focus on entrepreneurship and business throughout the engineering degree. So for me, as I mentioned, I chose to specialize in computer and civil engineering, which actually changed to civil mining engineering in my fourth year. It's a very flexible program, but it, it's a real engineering degree, just nobody's heard of it. Um, currently, I, I'm working at the city of Calgary. I've worked at three different companies uh, so far, but I'm a wireless engineer in training. I've been there for about three months uh, following being laid off from an oil and gas company, so that was a large experience for me and quite a harrowing experience. I'll share a little bit more about that later. And then a fun fact, uh, I really, really like traveling. This is actually from that Singapore exchange in 2019. Uh, we traveled to Hong Kong, and this is Dragon's Back Hike in Hong Kong. So beautiful hike, it kind of goes up and down, up and down, kind of as you're walking up the back of the dragon. So beautiful hike, lots of photos. And now we can actually do hikes as well, it's no longer COVID. So uh, I hope all of you also enjoy hiking over the summer if you get a chance to. Okay, a little bit about my technical journey and uh, different companies I worked at. I actually started at the city of Calgary. That was my second year internship that nobody else got. I felt very proud of myself. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, see all you suckers didn't get an internship. But that's okay. That was just my competitive spirit coming up. Um, so I was there for four months. Uh, worked at the city of Vancouver as well in project services. That was for eight months. Uh, did my final student internship in 2019, halfway through COVID. So I had five months in office and seven months from home. So that was an interesting experience, but very data focused as well. And then uh, full time, I worked at Suncor for two years before being laid off in October of last year. And then I found my next opportunity just three months ago uh, at the city of Calgary, where I'm now pursuing my engineering training designation and I should be getting my PM shortly. So almost at the end of the road, very exciting for me. For each of these experiences, there's two main focuses and it was kind of nicely how everything laid together. There was a focus on data and data analytics for every single experience that I had a chance to do, whether my role was related to data analytics or not. And the second one was personal branding. And I'll touch a little bit on that as well because I think it's going to be helpful to share how I managed to take my personal branding experience and apply it so that my second job led to my first one. My volunteering experience led to the first job. The second led to the, or the first led to the second, second to third, and so on. So that was an important part and communication as well. <laughs> so 901, uh, we'll just briefly share, uh, very cool experience, that is me, thankfully not in the back seat, that was the joke when I made the, <laughs> made the post on Facebook, but that was a cool experience. Uh, a lot of focus on how data obtained internally from different business units across Calgary 911 could be used to figure out which hardware and software systems were critical and not critical. So an example could be if your 911 primary phone line, they also have a secondary phone line in case the first one goes down. That's a critical system. You need that to be running with five nines availability for 99.999% of the time. So just a couple minutes of plan outage per year. Um, or other systems such as the light bulb on a desk when a call comes through, that's, that's not critical. That can have like one nine availability. So 90% off time or two nines, that's not mission critical. So that was some, some, uh, an example of how some data was involved, even in my very first internship, which was not data related, it was just generic uh, summer student position at 9 So that was an interesting experience for me. Uh, my next one, which was the following years, I worked with the project delivery branch at City of Vancouver. So there, it was all civil engineering. So that was how I chose to actually do that specialization in civil engineering following this internship. So I was going to do computer and civil engineering and do those two together because of this internship. And a lot of the data that I was dealing uh, with at the project delivery branch in City of Vancouver was project related milestones. So the different steps of project planning, so I should know them, but I forget them, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> different steps to do with project planning, different milestones, uh, planning for materials coming in, construction timelines, close our project timelines, just generic project management, but specifically for civil focus, since everything we're dealing with is transportation or utilities or streets, as so applied to civil engineering context. My last internship was in 2019, this was the COVID one, um, but this was with the autonomous haulage systems team at Suncor Energy. Uh, this is where you have your huge uh, yellow dump trucks or haul trucks, uh, that's a smaller tile size of the 430E, they have 480Es, which are even larger. Um, the joke that we had at, with the summer students when I was working is that one tire is equivalent to 
one student's salary for one year. So I'm basically a tire. <laughs> Focus on data analytics for this specific term were two parts. The first one it was app development. So I had my chance to work on full stack development, back end and front end, uh, where we effectively used Power BI and the back end being SQL databases to create an application, which you can see our little scrum team of just six holding on the phone, let uh, mine supervisors and superintendents see real time data about how their mine was performing. And even from looking at this picture, it's a little bit far, but you can see there's a needle and it's in the green. Do you think that's good or bad? Good. Done. See, none of you have experience working with this app and already you, half of you know how to use it. So super intuitive, super easy to use. That was the focus of creating it. So we don't need to deliver a help guide for these superintendents that are very busy, don't have a lot of time in their day. So I don't have time to, to read this document. I have other shit to do. Just let me pick it up and use it and figure it out. So that's kind of the constraints that we have to work with for creating this application and figuring out how to make it very usable. The second part, which was new for me, is, and that was my first opportunity in the bottom photo here, we had a bring your kids to work day. So we had grade nine students come to Sunport and I volunteered on my team because I love speaking, I'm very energetic, I love spending time with people, to take this very complex concept of autonomously operated haul trucks and convey it to grade nine students um, and, and see what they can understand. To my surprise, they were way smarter than I thought. They're asking some really hard questions at the end. I was, I, was, I was blown away. But that was my first opportunity for actually sharing about data analytics, what it can be used for, and we used little fun pictures and, and the whole truck cycle. So that was a, my first experience sharing, and after that grade nine presentation, I just wanted to share it more. Now we, we're here today, four years later. Uh, the very last one, which is where I am today, uh, three months at Wireless Communication Solutions. It's actually not a data related role. I'm not working with data specifically uh, in this role, um, but that's just because of my own personal choice. I spent three years in data analytics, had an excellent career time there, and then now I want to bring my attention back to my engineering training designation, and specifically working in the, in, in the IT space, so in order to get my data. So that was just a career decision that I personally made, but still very much enjoyed my time in the data analytics role. Needs to get insights that can be used to improve things, and we can also, as mentioned, reveal trends and metrics that might otherwise be lost in tables or Excel sheets with millions of rows. So that's something that Excel can, and, or any types of data analytics techniques can help us with. Then finally, you can actually use this data and try to optimize decisions, just as mentioned at the end. So this can be for businesses, for research groups, doesn't matter. For me specifically, I had industry experience, that's what is applicable for me. But those are some of the things that you can do, and this is really just at its core raw data and you do something to it in order to give you some insight that you wouldn't have seen otherwise if you just looked at it. So let's talk about the four different types of data analytics and what I've had a chance to work with. And I have this beautiful little graph. Uh, on our y-axis we have value, so as we increase on the y-axis it's more value to your organization or your business or your team. But as well, the further value you get, it is linear with complexity. You either need more resources, more knowledge, or more people in order to get more value coming out of these present, out of the different types of analytics. So we start at the most basic raw level, and somebody out there actually said descriptive analytics, so I'm, I'm very happy and very proud of whoever said that. But descriptive analytics, this is the core and the most baseline of a data analytics uh, computation that you can perform. And this is trying to understand what is happening. What is happening with your data? Nothing further. So in order to have accurate descriptive analytics, you should likely have correct data. So if that's a different technique called data filtering and data wrangling or data cleansing, it's where you go through and you clean your data. A quick example is you ask people to enter in a number from zero to 100, somebody enters in 102, and somebody else enters in Canada. You should probably exclude those data points from your data set where you're gonna have some skewed data, or you'll just have very bad results. So at its core, descriptive analytics is what is happening. And I'll give an example of descriptive analytics. Um, one easy way that we can think of it together is just in a basketball game. You could try to identify the points scored in a basketball game based on the player's height. So we can imagine a linear correlation. I'm not a basketball player, but keeping it simple, a taller player would be able to more, like have more slam dunks on the basket per se, versus a shorter player, if they don't have the vertical height, uh, might have trouble scoring. So very simple, we're not thinking why, we're not thinking 
what the reason is, but just looking at the raw data, what is happening. And all of us can actually perform this because you don't need to perform any computation on your data. You just look at your raw data and you try to make an understanding of what is happening with your data. Let's look at the second step. So one layer further, diagnostic analytics. Still possible to perform, and I was actually working with diagnostic analytics as well, just by myself using Excel and SQL, but looking at why is it happening? That's the second question. Why is it happening? So what we're trying to find is, or we're finding the causes of why we might be seeing these trends in the data, and as well, we're actually identifying and separating patterns. So going back to that basketball example, what we might actually infer is that we, we noticed, so the, the raw descriptive data showed us that taller players were getting more slam dunks. Okay, let's, let's ask ourselves why. Why do we think this is happening? Could this be because the taller player is physically closer to the basket? Could it be because taller players have played more basketball? Or could it be that taller players are just better at the sport? Those are all questions of why. Um, maybe taller players are harder to block. There could be many reasons, but we are looking at the why, specifically with diagnostic analytics. So not just looking at what's happening with the data, but trying to ask yourself the questions of why. Let's go to the third layer. And this, the jump from the second layer to the third layer, I believe is where you need specialization and individuals that have those specific skill sets, something that I actually don't have because I didn't go down the career path. So let's look at the third one. And this is where we look at machine learning and some more interesting questions. So we look at predictive analytics. And what predictive analytics tells us is what is likely to happen next? So it's actually giving us the core identity. We're looking at now potentially selecting a machine learning algorithm in order to perform a predictive model for us. And also, applied to an industry perspective, this can help us build a business strategy. For example, uh, let's say, I'm gonna go back to, to mining, for example. Um, I am in charge of a specific uh, mine area, and I need to decide on a certain given day how many of those trucks am I going to send in there. I could send eight, I could send ten, or I could send twelve. Traditionally, what my supervisors and superintendents would do is just look at the last shift or look at the last few days and say, okay, we've done pretty well with ten. Um, I had bad results with eight, okay results with twelve. Let's do ten or twelve. And they kind of just, okay, done. They make the decision. Um, we go move some dirt around. We make money. Okay, cool. Day's done. If we introduce predictive analytics, what we could actually do is supply maybe the last one to five years of data, looking at on each given shift, there were this many haul trucks working, and we can factor in other conditions such as weather, such as visibility, such as the ore quality of the specific mines. It says you dig, you're going through different layers of dirt and earth, and then based on different factors, if you have a person with a specialization in data science, they can help produce a machine learning model that can actually give a prediction. Oh, tomorrow, uh, based on factors A, B, and C, and given that you have up to 12 trucks available, I recommend that you do 11 trucks in order to get the best uh, ore quality, or the, the, mo the most quantity of ore back to the hopper, for example. Or in the basketball example, we can predict scores in future games. I think that player John is going to score 32 points because he's playing against these people He's playing with these specific teammates, and this is how he's been doing over the past two years. So that's specifically predictive analytics, and you do need uh, understanding and a base knowledge in machine learning fundamentals or deep learning, or somebody with usually on our teams at the events analytics team, we would be working with data scientists that would be the leads for developing for specifically predictive modeling for machine learning. I'll briefly finish with the fourth type and the most complex that requires the most amount of human involvement and resources and knowledge. And this is the last click on the slide, so this is a good place to take a picture. But specifically, prescriptive analytics. And prescriptive analytics is the final, in my mind, most advanced step you can get at, which is the actual application or algorithm telling you what do you need to do next. So it's not telling us what's happening, it's not telling us why it's happening, it's not telling us what's likely to happen. Oh, you, if you send out 11 trucks tomorrow, you're likely to have 500 kilograms of production, but it's actually telling you what you need to do and giving you a recommendation. So that's prescriptive analytics. Now we're definitely using advanced analytics, so at the Suncor team I was with, we had data engineers to build the pipelines, data scientists to actually build the models, and then people like myself, data biz analysts, to produce dashboards and give recommendations to end users. So, um, for example, in that mining, how do I optimize efficiency for the next shift? Uh, the app 
tells you that you should go and put 11 trucks up there. So it's giving you that recommendation. Or maybe even some of us are using machine learning. If anybody uses Spotify, it actually sometimes gives you recommendations for what songs to listen to. How are you feeling today? Happy, sad, nostalgic, lethargic? And then based on what you click, it'll give you a personalized recommendation based on the past history of songs you've been listening to. So very, very advanced information. I myself cannot perform uh, prescriptive analytics since I do not have that skill set. The furthest I've performed is diagnostic but specifically working within a team such as the advanced analytics team that was at Suncor, you can have applications and different softwares that are actually giving this information to industry people or users. So very advanced, but it tells you what you need to do. Um, excellent type of analytics. If your company or team has the resources to perform it, it can save a lot of money in the long run. So that was a lot of info. Um, I'll briefly wrap up uh, on this first part is, is the so what? Why should you care? about data analytics. And again, at its core as, as the takeaway, it'll help your business to optimize your performance and also make informed decisions. Even if you're using that very base level of descriptive analytics, it might help give a little bit more insight to whoever those decision makers are on what decisions they should be making to make more money or save efficiency or reduce operating costs. You name it. Even maybe reducing the runtime of your machine learning algorithm during the training phase. It could be something as simple as that. Um, a few points here. Yeah, mention that. Um, yeah, that's basically why it's important. You can help make better products or services. That's the general gist of it. Yeah. So that's the first half of the second half of the presentation. So that should have hopefully given you a base foundation of uh, what data analytics is. Uh, why it's important for different businesses or research groups to use, and also the four different types that we talked about. And then finally, the so what, so why should you? It's becoming a data analyst. So specifically, this ties in to my technical journey as we walk through together of the different career roles that I have. And then also, if any of what I've talked about for the last 30, 40 minutes is somewhat of an interest for you and you're like, yes, I am sort of interested about maybe doing a career path, but I'm not sure which one I want to do. The second half of the presentation will show you um, how you can get into it as a career and some of the different career options available for you. Um, there's three main types. Um, of, if we look at data analytics as an umbrella, and we go one, one layer down, we start with three main types of analytics, um, which is data science, sorry, no, data engineering, data science, and then data analytics. So I'll briefly chat about what uh, each one entails. So for the first one, which is data engineering, this is typically in large data, uh, large data processes. This is where the data starts. So I have a sensor in the field. Let's say it's just a temperature sensor. It records temperature every one minute. That's all it does. It spits out a number in a table. 12 degrees, 13.2 <coughs> degrees, 11 degrees. Um, what specifically data engineers do is they're responsible for helping develop a framework in order to translate this data from, uh, from the field, from sources. It could be like from a survey, for example, if like you're given a survey at the end of this presentation and you type in different, like how much did you enjoy, five or one. Um, taking all that and then it gets exported to an Excel file, that's the easy way of doing it. Data engineers that are specifically database centric, which are responsible for building out the table and where this data is stored, um, that's the role that they do. You could think specifically of a database-centric engineer, uh, such as they design the foundation of this room and this building. This is where we are going to be sitting in. This is where data will be stored. If each of us is a data point, database-centric uh, yeah, database engineer designs the actual space where this data lives, is stored, is updated, is deleted, is replicated, whatever you need with it. The second sub-specialization of data engineers is specifically pipeline-centric engineers. And those are engineers that actually help translate the data through data pipelines from your source into your table. So for example, the analogy is all of you parked or commuted outside this building, you had to walk up the stairs, you used the different signage to get to this room and then you sat down and now you're in your assigned data cell space. So that's an analogy for what pipeline-centric engineers do. They help get the data from the source into whatever table it needs to be, uh, needs to be stored in, and as well, they can help with some of the data filtering or cleansing if needed. For the second component, and we, we go literally, after the data engineer, and this is more for your predictive and prescriptive analytics, uh, after your data engineer has finished 
putting the table into, let's say, an Excel sheet, and it's there. But the data scientists are the big data writers. Uh, they can help gather and analyze large sets of data, and uh, it could be either structured or unstructured data. And then they're actually going to be working on analyzing, processing, and modeling the data to help bring some sort of insights out. So typically, this is where data scientists will apply uh, regular or advanced machine learning models to get some kind of trends coming out of that data. So looking at those more complex data types like we looked at before. And then finally, for the third type, and this is where my role specifically was, and this is the last slide as well, um, it's data analysts. So these are the individuals that are responsible for looking at how this data can be used to answer questions and solve problems for your business or organization. And as well, they can actually study and look at the trends to try to make predictions for, for the future as well. Underneath the data analyst role, there's a subdivision, which is data visualization analytics. That's what I did. Uh, that's, as your question said, it's building the story. Uh, now that we have all this data, it's been filtered, we've performed analytics on it, we have predictions on it. How do I, as a data visualization analyst, give it to you as an end user so you can actually go and make a decision based on it? Is it going to be through graphs? Is it going to be through telling a journey of the story? There's a, many presentations on this, but that's a whole different field of data storytelling specifically. So um, I can give you a resource on that after if you like, but we'll pull another presentation of how to actually, because your data is crap unless you can deliver it well to somebody and they have to make a decision on it. Because I'm not a decision maker. The director or the VP is gonna make decisions and it's up to me as the biz analyst to actually go and show, okay, this is what's been happening in your business unit for the last year. This is what we found. These are the true past trends and this is what we're predicting with 95% accuracy you go make the decision, because I'm not the decision maker, you are. So that's more of the data visualization, and that's what I was doing, building dashboards in Power BI. So that was my part. So um, now that we know a little bit about the three types, uh, I'm going to share some of the different responsibilities, descriptions, what you do, what you need to know. So let's start with a uh, job description. Uh, so for data scientists, kind of as I mentioned before, we're developing, implementing, and testing a hypothesis to try to present data-led solutions to your business. So using machine learning algorithm to see, can I predict some sort of future trend based on past existing data that's been cleaned? For our DAs or data analysts, it's more front-end focused, where maybe reviewing and analyzing some of the data, potentially doing some data cleaning if we need to assist the data scientists, and we're trying to help make informed business decisions. So presenting it to an important person and they're gonna make a decision based on our data. And then finally, if we look at our data engineers, so we have our pipeline-centric and our database-centric engineers. This is your lawyer backend. Now's a good time for the picture of the slide if you like. So these guys are focused on your infrastructure and architecture for where your data is going to live, and they can work with information systems as well. Uh, what are some of the key skills? So if you are interested in doing one of these roles, where do you need to upskill yourself in order to be successful in one of these role types? Specifically for data scientists, it's going to be more algorithmic and logical based, which could include problem solving, programming, mathematics, uh, using Hadoop as uh, different software solutions, um, also statistical modeling, which is the last bullet point on there. That one's very key in order to be successful as a data scientist. These are some of the skills that hiring companies are looking when they're hiring for data scientists. For data analysts, this is more of your front-end application as well. Uh, you're looking at communication skills, both verbal and visual as well. Uh, statistical information does help. Typically, data analysts are more entry-level roles based on the job descriptions I was looking at when I was applying for my first one. And your DSs and DEs, you can interpret what those are, are more advanced with more years of experience. So you're typically starting in a DA role as the most basic, least amount of uh, difficulty, if you will, and then either you stay in a DA and go down data visualization route, that's what I did, or you can expand either into the machine learning side, which is DS, or more into database design, SQL design, refreshes, pipelines, which is more DE-based. Those are the two directions you can go there. Finally, for data engineers, some of the skills, definitely advanced analytical or programming experience is useful, as well as data warehousing experience. Um, so this can be, again, as mentioned, where are you storing this data and how are you getting this data to be reliably stored when you have millions of rows of data that can be refreshed, updated, how are you dealing with craft data, replacing it. So that those are what some of the DEs are doing. Those are some of the key skills. Task requirements, so 
what, what are we doing in a day in these roles? Uh, keep in mind, again, I was more of a data analyst. That's kind of where I live. But again, um, this is just generalized information of what you can expect uh, in each types of these roles. So specifically, starting with data scientists, uh, you might develop hypotheses. Okay, um, what might I expect to be happening with this data before I'm even performing any analytics on it? Uh, apply algorithms to actually test these analytics, so the type of machine learning model, for example, there's many different ones that can be used. And, and leading um, data-led business solutions to business challenges. So there's some of the individuals that are kicking it off and saying, okay, I think we should use this model versus this model, and here's why. So they're not really talking with end users, but they're talking with the team manager or the product <coughs> owner. Bless you, one. Uh, which solution we should be going for. For a data analyst, this is more of your basic and introductory level. You're maybe uh, gathering and cleansing different data, organizing it. We're generally identifying patterns such as, okay, I'm seeing a correlation, taller players, more points. Something as simple as that. That's kind of what I'm looking at when I'm doing exploratory data analysis, when I get a new set of data, keeping it simple and light, just with that descriptive data. Um, and potentially, if you like, you could assist data engineers with maintaining databases or work with machine learning models, and also database. So that's a whole different specialization of itself. So that's kind of where I decided to go into. And that's, as the gentleman over there asked, we're looking at some Power BI models. So not Power BI models, just like using Power BI as a front-end solution for generating graphs, different tables, allowing users to interact with data. Um, there can be more, it doesn't have to be Power BI, there's other applications as well. Could just be Excel as well. Manager comes to me, hey, um, I just wanna see how my business unit sales have been doing over the last two months in southwest region of Calgary. Go show me. Quick Excel, pull some data from a server, do some filters on it, so it's just data from that center. Uh, I go look at trends, make one graph in Excel that shows each month how many sales were. Done. Just show them an Excel sheet. If it's that simple. If it's a more complex ask, like I want a fully functioning with these 12 different requirements and I want to be able to show it to my sales manager, my technical manager, that's where I start thinking, okay, how am I going to design more tables? As I mentioned with that app example, we had a different page for each different user actually. So we had a maintenance engineers, so supply engineers, reliability engineers. So based on the role type, we're showing and giving them different data. They can still look at anything, but specifically like for your role, you don't care about all these other cool trends we have. You just care how well is my client. And also obviously uh, one of the main ones is building data architectures. So where's this data going to be stored and how can my DS data scientist access this data to perform different machine learning algorithms on them, for example. That's some of what you do. This is the last uh, slide, kind of in this section, and, and this is possible career paths. So once you start in this role, um, I was a data biz analyst for two and a half years. Um, that's what I did, then I moved it back into different industry. Now I'm in uh, IT, and I do uh, wireless engineering, so a different field. But what are some of the different areas that you can go into? Let's say you've had five years of experience as a data scientist. Where does it go from there? Um, so you can actually go to different specializations as a data scientist. You can actually go back into data biz after you've worked as a DS. You can look at data mining, uh, or even you can go into database management as well. So many options for data scientists for some of the career paths for them. For DAs, you can go and uh, be a business analyst, a VA, working more with stakeholders and internal or external clients for figuring out, well, what do you want to see? I'm mean, not actually working on the data anymore, but I'm helping you as an end user understand what do you want to see to help you be most effective in your role. Um, or you could, yeah, that's one of the main ones, be it. Then finally, for data engineers, uh, you could go even deeper into either the pipeline route or the database-centric route, or you can become a big data engineer as well. That's another interesting career path that data engineers can go down. So I briefly mentioned this kind of throughout the post, but I'll just summarize it. Uh, what's been my experience specifically working in the, in the data analytics world, if you will? So I was a data analyst, that was at its core. I chose to specialize in data visualization. So I was working a lot with front-end consumers and clients, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, a lot of face-to-face -face time on, what do you want to see? I'm here to help make this application a reality, but this application dream a reality for you. Sorry, so how to deliver that. I also had a cool opportunity to work as a business analyst, so it was actually working with end users, not data related, but just what do you do day to day in your role? What would you like to see and how can we help you? 
So really working like a customer facing role, uh, less technical, but still having to gather requirements from end users and then convert them into technical requirements for the design team to actually go and build an app out. How many pages, what's on each page, what's the refresh time for this application, all that goes in together. And then finally, uh, UI UX design. So actually building wireframes for dashboards. What's going to go in each spot? Is this going to be a desktop app? Is this going to be a mobile app? How many pages will it have? What graphs am I showing? Kind of like the question of the story. At the top, I show the most important one on the phone, and then as they scroll down, it gets less important. Where do you go to the locational filter? It's very self-intuitive. And that was my specific design methodology when I was building dashboards, and that was just one that we showed you there, but there's many others uh, that were developed. So we've gone to the end, a lot of info. Um, this is the actual, actionable part for you, which is what I recommend to you based on my about two and a half, three years of experience within this field of what you can do basically when we finish this talk. If you are interested in any of these different fields and if you want to pursue them, what can you do right now? How can we get into this career path? First one, take the first step to learn about the field, which you have done by being here. So that's the first step. You've already completed, done. You're 10% done. So even just taking the time, signing up for this micro learning course, listening to me talk for about 45, 50 minutes, I think, um, you've already taken the first step, which is first exposure into what is all this about. Um, what you could do further, if you like, is you can build a technical data analytics skill set. So specifically, this is what some of those entry levels uh, are looking for based on my experience applying to many jobs. Um, so you can look at developing and learning about statistics, uh, coding languages such as SQL, R, Python, or DAX. Those are good languages. Um, you can look at Power BI or Tableau. Those are the two main softwares that I use. Power BI is free as well, so that's a very uh, great inclusive way to start designing dashboards. And also basic data cleansing and preparation. So how do I take an Excel sheet that has 200 rows of data, what are good ways, instead of just manually looking line by line and seeing if it's the criteria, how can I apply maybe some programming or some filters to clean out a whole bunch of crap data that is skewing my data or making the results very bad if, you, if we have millions of rows of data? Because I'm not going to go, no matter how much you pay me, I'm not going to go look at each one individually. Maybe if they pay me a lot, I will. Um, and then the last recommendation here is you can work on projects with real data as well. Uh, this is something that I did for one of my research projects in university, where we actually went and took the uh, Titanic data set from Kaggle.com, and then we performed a, just a basic project on very basic machine learning algorithms. I forget exactly what it was, but we got some real data, and that was very worthy of experience for me. Um, Last set of recommendations, if you are e even further interested and very enthusiastic, you can att attend hackathons, just basic programming hackathons. Microsoft, a lot of big companies offer them. At many universities, uh, even like IEEE offers hackathons as well. Or if you want to go a step further, specifically with an emphasis on data analytics problems or dashboarding solutions. It could be like a dashboarding competition. We had one at Suncor, and then we all built a dashboard. It took less than 10 hours, boom, done. Didn't have to be great, but it was a good learning curve. You can develop your personal portfolios, so that's updating your resume and your CV. Even if you don't have any job experience working in a data analytics role, what I actually did for my first role is on my cover letter, and I actually built a tailored resume for that Suncor role as well. I had put uh, introductory YouTube videos on data analytics introduction. That's it, just spent two hours, watch the videos. That was basically the extent of my data analytics understanding going into the first role. And it wasn't my technical knowledge that got me that role. Again, it was the people and volunteering skills, but as well, just like, hey, this guy, is, he's shown us that he's actually gone and watched a couple YouTube videos that's better than the other people that have not done too much. He's actually taken a step on his own. So we're gonna give him a step. And they even told me, you are not the best candidate. There are other people more experienced than you in data analytics, but you seem eager. That's what we're looking for. So that helped me a lot, specifically. If you want to take it a step further, which I did not do, but you are more than welcome to, you can pursue formal education. It could be in fields such as mathematics, um, engineering, any type, uh, data science is also good undergrad degrees if you have them. Uh, or you can look at master's degrees in data science, and even the University of Calgary offers a joint degree in data science and business administration. Those two combined together, UBC does as well, it's the Bucks program at UBC. So that's another option you could do if you're interested in pursuing your formal education. 
Second last point is applying for internships or entry level roles, even if you're underqualified or even if you're overqualified. I was definitely very underqualified when I was applying for my first roles, but what it gave me is experience. Uh, what are the different job descriptions looking for? That's why I came up with some of the points earlier. Uh, what do I need to spend and focus my time on? Like, what websites do I Google? Top 50 data visualization technical questions and reviewing those. And even if I somehow got to the end stage interview but was still underqualified and I was rejected several times, I know what questions they're asking. So for the next interview, I actually had more time to prepare and I have real questions. I'm like, okay, this is what the recruiter asked me. Was I prepared for this one? Yes. Was I prepared for this one? No. That's what I need to work on in practice, then back to Googling and back to the bathroom here to practice and practice. That's what landed me my first roles and helped it keep going. The very last one, uh, this is something you have to have. Um, you need to be excited about this stuff. If you're just looking for some job to apply for, you can tailor your resume, you can do your cover letter, you can practice questions, you might even get the job. Will you get the job? Yes. Will you enjoy it? I don't think so. You need to really be excited. So if anything that I've presented or shared sparked some sort of interest in you, yes, I'm interested in learning about this, yes, I want to do this as a career path, but there you have it, you have the answer. So that's the last thing I can recommend, just get excited about it.